Greetings everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're finally starting the Manifold series. This is something I've been wanting to get done for like over a year now probably and I finally got the chance to do it because now I'm on uni break so I really have nothing else better to do with my time so might as well work on a bunch of these videos. So yeah, I'm probably going to do like one video a week and today we're just going to be starting off with a fairly brief introduction to manifolds and that's really the main goal with most of the videos in this series anyways is to keep them nice and brief not hour long lectures or anything like that um, while still going over a lot of the contents you might see in a differential geometry course so yeah without further ado let's jump straight into it the main goal of this video is to define what a topological manifold is and as you can see, it has the word topological in it, which means we will need to know a little bit of topology. Not too much though, you could probably get by this video series just by knowing roughly what a topological space is, what a topology is, what continuity is, just some of the basic topological concepts. So what is a topological space? Well, you start off with a set. Now a set is just a very abstract collection of things, you might think about it that way, and there's not really any order or any structure to that set. Now you put something called a topology onto this set and it becomes a topological space, and roughly what that does is it defines what the neighbourhoods of your set might look like. So it's not this random, just chaotic collection of abstract things anymore. You know roughly what the neighbourhoods look like, so it's more like an elastic jelly or, or something like that, you could think about it that way. So first of all, topological manifold, it's a topological space. And I'll call this topological space, let's call it M. So this is the set that we're working over. And then we'll give it a topology as well. Let's call it curly O. So I think I usually use tau for this, but um, I'll use curly O for this video series just because it looks cooler. So it's a topological space um, that is, so it's not just any random topological space, it has to satisfy certain conditions, which we'll take a look at. So first of all, let's take a look at some examples of topological spaces we know fairly well. So some examples of topological spaces here. So the sphere is a good example. So the sphere, this is what we usually call S2 here. Now the sphere, you, you just think about this as the set of all these points and then you could put the topology onto the sphere by imagining it's embedded in three-dimensional space somehow and then you can put the um, subset topology on there. Or if you want to be extra fancy, what you could actually do is you can construct the sphere from just a disk over here. So this is a disk in R2. The sphere you can make out of all these points because what you can do is you can just identify the circumference. So the circumference you kind of think about just being one point and then you'll need to take the quotient topology on this if you've seen that before, which means you kind of identify all the points on the circumference and you kind of pull it up like a little dumpling and it turns into a sphere. Now the sphere, as we see it, it's a round and that's just how we usually imagine the sphere. Now at the level of a topological space, this is a topological space over here, Topological spaces only cares about the neighbourhoods of these sets of points here. It has no idea what geometry means, it has no idea what lengths or angles or distances or any of those geometric concepts means. Which means you can deform the sphere into a, for example, a potato shape or something, um, continuously, of course, which means you're not pulling the sphere apart or um, pinching points together. You could turn it into some kind of potato shape over here, and this guy we still call S2. And if you've done topology before, you know exactly what this is called. This is called a homeomorphism, or just a homeo for short. And you don't even have to make sure that the surfaces are round because topological spaces have no clue what differentiation or smoothness means. And in fact, if you want to be able to preserve this smoothness, then you could say, you would need to use the concept of a diffeomorphism instead, which we might come to once we introduce differentiable structures. So this is an example of a topological space we have so far. What's another example? Well, the torus is a good example. So this is um, something that looks like this over here. So it has a, a hole into it. And this is what we call T1. And of course, you can deform the torus in any way you want. You can turn it into a coffee mug if you want to. But just note that the torus is definitely not homeomorphic to the sphere, right? Which means you can't find a map that takes you from the sphere to the torus, um, which is bijective and continuous because you have to pull the sphere apart to make this hole here, which is not continuous or not a homeomorphism. So these two spaces are topologically different from each other. Let's do another example. Let's say um, the circle, for instance. 
Well, the circle is something that looks like this. This is what we call S1. So the circle is just the set of all these points over here. And you can put a topology onto this circle, for instance, in multiple ways. Now, this circle, just like with these other examples, you can deform it as much as you want. So this circle, it's really the same thing as, for example, yeah, a triangle or any just a closed loop that's non-self-intersecting. Right, and maybe one more example, because these are kinds of topological spaces we can visualize. Topological spaces can get very abstract. I guess a very, a very simple example of a topological space, I believe it's called Sipinski space, which is just the set of two points here. And the neighborhoods of this set, well, it just looks something like this. So you have the whole set as being one neighborhood, and then it just chooses a single point, uh, which is in its own little neighborhood. So all of these guys, these are topological spaces, but it turns out the first three that I drew, these are topological manifolds. So what makes these into manifolds? It's because if you take a look on a small enough region of each of these spaces, let's say um, this region over here, this little open subset, let's say, um, this kind of looks like a piece of R2. In particular, you can kind of draw a little coordinates patch on this, a little R2 region onto the sphere here, like so. And you can do the same for the torus. You could pick, for example, this little neighborhood over here, and then you can construct some kind of a coordinate patch. So it kind of looks like R2 in that region. And to be a bit more precise, what I actually mean by that is you can find a map, let's call it X over here. So it's a map X that takes you into R2 in some way. So the image of this funny blob on the torus might look something like this inside of Euclidean space. It's basically a map which takes you from a part of your topological space into Euclidean space in some way. And this is really nice over here because topological spaces, they're very, very abstract. And what this map allows you to do is talk about a point in your very abstract topological space in a bit more of a concrete manner because now you can talk about points here in terms of tuples of real numbers as a coordinate. So this map X over here along with this little domain, this is what we're going to be calling a chart later on and we'll explore this in the next video a bit further. And now notice X over here, we kind of want this to be a homeomorphism because we want this image in Euclidean space in this nice Euclidean space to resemble this part of our topological space in some way. So you need to be able to move back and forth. It also needs to be continuous because you don't want to rip things apart and whatnot. So it has to be a homeomorphism, this map X here. Now, how about the circle down here? This is just S1. Well, you can't really map it into R2 in any way. It's not homeomorphic. You can't find a homeomorphism. So what's the next best thing you can do? Well, you can try R1, for instance. R1 is still Euclidean space. So if you take a look on a small part of this circle, let's say this little subset over here, then you can definitely find a map, let's call it X once again, that takes you into a section of just one dimensional space. So maybe it maps you into this little interval here. And this topological space, this Sapinski space, there's no way to do this. You're trying to find a bijection between a set of two points and a set with uncountably many points. You just can't do it. So in fact, this over here, this would not classify as a topological manifold because you can't map small regions of your topological space into sections of Euclidean space. All right, so notice this is something you shouldn't be able to do locally, which means on a small enough region on your topological space, not necessarily the entire topological space. So for example, the sphere is entirely different to R2. Yet if you take a look on a small region, then it's homeomorphic to just a small section of R2. So globally, it might be completely different, but locally, then you can find a homeomorphism. So back to the definition we're trying to construct over there, a topological space MO. That is, first of all, we need that this is a locally Euclidean. Now let's put locally Euclidean into a bit more of mathematical formalism, I guess. What we mean by locally Euclidean, it means that for all points P inside of your topological space, let's say I go to the sphere here and I pick, um, I don't know, this point P, let's say, so I pick a point on my topological space, then we must be able to construct some kind of neighborhood, some kind of open neighborhood around that point P that maps into part of Euclidean space. So what I mean by that is there exists a sum map X that takes you from, now there's going to be a domain which is a subset of your space, let's call it U, and you want this U here to contain the point P that you're interested in. So here's the point P that we're after, 
And you want to be able to find some domain U in your topological space that includes the points P. So it includes the points P. Now U has to be an open subset as well. So what do we mean by that? It just means that it comes from the topology that we're given over here already. Right, so X takes you from this subset into, well, the image of U under the map X, so X of U, and X of U needs to be a part of Euclidean space. So let's say we have the subset over here. What we want is to find a map X that takes us into just a part of Euclidean space. And for the sphere example, this would be R2, so you would get some blob in R2 like so. So this could be a subset of Euclidean space of any dimension. We're just doing two and one dimensional Euclidean space so we can actually visualize them. But this could be any dimension, let's just call it D. And this D over here, this is what we call the dimension of the topological space. And furthermore, this dimension, it has to be fixed for all points of P in M. So for example, um, the dimension of these two topological spaces here, this is um, dim m equals 2 if you want well, let's not say m let's say s2 here because that's the set and then we have dimension of t1 is also equal to 2 and then we have the dimension of our s1 space this is equal to 1 right so we have that concept of dimension and it has to be fixed so for example if i have a sphere over here so a sphere that's two dimensional and then i decide to attach a little strand onto the sphere about well, the body of the sphere this is definitely two-dimensional, so dim m equals two on the body of the sphere, but then on the strands here, dimension of m equals one, which is not constant. So this wouldn't classify as a topological manifold at all. And furthermore, at that point where the strand in the sphere kind of intersects there, or if you are at that specific point there and you try to find an open neighborhood around there, well, it's not even homeomorphic to any yeah, Euclidean space. So this would be an example of a non-manifold. Some other examples, for instance, is if you have an infinity symbol over here where you intersect at the point, um, this wouldn't be a topological manifold at all. All right, so this is what it means for our topological manifold to be locally Euclidean. You just need this condition here to hold. And now this X, as I kind of mentioned to you before, this is what we call a chart or a chart map to be precise because it is a map. So this is our chart map over here. And this chart map has to be a homeomorphism, which means it's bijective and it doesn't tear things apart and whatnot. So that's our X there. And then that's U, which is the domain of X. This is what we call the chart domain. And your chart domain has to be an open subset of your topological space, which means it comes from the topology. And both of these guys together, this is what we're gonna be calling a chart. So a topological manifold, it's a topological space that's locally Euclidean. Now that's not quite the only condition we need. We need two more conditions actually, which aren't too important, I guess. Well, they are important if you want to do things rigorously. Your topological space also has to be Hausdorff. And what Hausdorff means is that if you have two points in your topological space, then you can separate them out nicely. Um, otherwise, you get weird examples of topological manifold. For example, I believe the line with the two origins or something like that. And um, that's what happens if you don't have the Hausdorff condition. And the other condition we need is second countable. And second countable just roughly means that your open neighborhoods, you can generate them from countably many basis elements. So those two conditions are there are just extra conditions we usually impose on manifolds so that we don't get funny examples. But locally Euclidean is just the main property of these topological spaces in order to qualify them as a topological manifold. So these manifolds over here, these are ones we can usually think about in three-dimensional space quite nicely, even though usually it's actually better to think about these topological manifolds from an intrinsic point of view, which means you don't want to make reference to the ambient space in which it's embedded. You want to view these spaces just from the set in which it's constructed. And there's many more abstract examples of topological manifolds. For example, um, the Klein bottle is a good one. Now, if you've seen the Klein bottle before, you might say, well, that's not a topological manifold is it because it's kind of like one of these counter examples i'll try draw a klein bottle here 
right? So it's kind of like a bottle and the neck grows up and then it kind of grows back inside of itself like so and it grows out in some way. You could probably find an image on Google which is better than what I've drawn over here. And you might say, well, is this a topological manifold because it seems like it's intersecting over here. Well, it turns out this intersection of the Klein bottle, that's just an artifact of how we embed it in three-dimensional space. Those two kinds of surfaces that we kind of see that intersect in our three-dimensional space doesn't even exist at all. So it turns out that if you instead embed the Klein bottle in four-dimensional space, you won't even see this intersection. So as a topological manifold, those two surfaces which we kind of see as intersecting, well, they're not intersecting at all. It's just a consequence of how we choose to embed it. So there's many more abstract examples of topological manifolds. My personal favorite at the moment is the buoy surface, which I'll display right over here as an image because I won't bother drawing it. And you might see that little intersection there just like the Klein bottle, but that's just an artifact of how we chose to embed it in our three-dimensional space. As a topological space, it doesn't see that intersection at all. You can even put a group structure on a manifold. So your manifold is literally a group now, and that's what's gonna be called a Lie group later on. I might make separate videos on that in the future because it is a pretty cool area to study. So manifolds, they can get very, very abstract. And because manifolds are locally Euclidean, we can cover our manifolds in these what are called charts here. And that's a nice way to describe points on your manifold, abstract points on your manifold, in a nice concrete way as this list of numbers. And he might say, well, manifolds, or small sections look like Euclidean space. We know Euclidean space quite well. Does that mean we could, for example, define distances using this chart? Well, that is a big no-no because there's many different ways to choose a chart. You can make charts very funny looking. You can even choose polar coordinates if you want to. There's many different ways to put coordinates on your manifold. So it's a very bad idea to define geometry in terms of charts because it's simply gonna be ill-defined. So geometry comes later when we define additional structures on our topological manifolds, for example, metrics and connections. That gives us a sense of geometry later on. But topological manifolds, as they are so far, are still very abstract. These are still very elastic and jelly objects, so you can just kind of swish them around however you want to. The only thing we know about these topological spaces so far is that if you look on a small enough scale, it looks Euclidean. So that's basically all for this video over here. In the next video, we're gonna be taking a look at more into charts and how different charts relate to one another. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this little introduction video. Make sure to subscribe if you want to follow along this series with me. And yeah, up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.